for folks who have just like true acid reflux, there's some licorice root in that blend alongside the herbals to help soothe and reduce inflammation within the GI tract. There was this sulfur protocol that you had mentioned. I think it's a, a high dose MSM and helpful, if I'm remembering correctly from our conversation, for bloating, distension, constipation individuals. But would love to hear more about this. Yeah. So this this was from um, Dr. Janelle, and she uh, presented this at the Gastro ANP conference in the fall of last year, 2023. So this is a wonderful gastroenterology conference for any practitioners listening. It's the Gastroenterology Association of Naturopathic Physicians, our annual conference. It's GI focused only. I love it. It's my favorite conference. She gave this very fascinating lecture where she explained that she's been using this high dose MSM, high dose sulfur treatment for SIBO patients with a lot of success. Um, and you know, what would be the mechanism here? You don't know, it's a little, it's a little wishy-washy in my mind. I'm not sure I care, but but the mechanisms put forward were that it's antimicrobial. Uh, it is for sure. And also that um many people have a sulfur deficiency. Correcting that can correct many things. And one of the things sulfur does in the body is it's part of our structural bonds. Um in our tissues. And so when we can when we can get those tissues strengthened, we might be able to affect motility and the migrating motor complex also, theoretically. Uh, and I mean, MSM no. is used for joint pain, right? That's right. As I understand it, yeah. So what but she does is um, she, she titrates people up from, you know, anywhere from a, a pinch to, you know, I don't know, like a half a teaspoon, and then gets them up to the full dose, which is 30 grams, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 30 grams. Yep. Two tablespoons. And then you do that for uh, two months and then step it back down to either being off of it or um, a maintenance dose of, of maybe around two and a half to five grams a day. Some people will need that ongoing. Others may not. She also does some other things. Um, she removes raw foods, cruciferous and allium vegetables and legumes. Uh, during that time. And she does warn that die off can occur because it is antimicrobial. So there are people that deal with that. And then she reintroduces the foods when she goes back down to the, uh, to the, you know, maintenance dose. And as you said, she says it works best for the chronic constipated, chronic bloated type of patient who will feel better when they pass gas, that gas comes out, like they, they have, uh, you know, fermentative gas accumulation. That's what the bloating is from. And, you know, she just shared case after case of success, and we were all really excited about it. So um, my friend and, and colleague, and also you've had her on, Dr. Alana Gurevich, she started uh, doing it in, in clinic with her patients. She really wanted to see how well this was, work, was working or would work. And she did it, last I heard, on about maybe 30 patients and has had very good success, that it worked for most but not all. And she she was focusing it on the chronic constipated, chronic bloating cases. She's now switching over to doing, trying it on diarrhea patients, um, SIBO patients, and we don't know how that's going to go yet. But basically the bloating is coming down and the bowel movements are occurring. So for whatever reason, I don't know, but I'm so grateful to Dr. Janelle for sharing this interesting, different, new treatment. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. This really does help us reach more people who are trying to improve their health. So it, it is uh, quite deeply appreciated. Chamomile is certainly for someone whose stress centralizes to their stomach, where as soon as you're stressed out, it just feels like there's a rock in your stomach. And no matter what you eat, you're just not digesting it. Everything kind of shuts off down there. So chamomile is nice because it not only acts as an anxiolytic and helps with the stress-driven fight or flight factor behind that digestive experience, but it also acts as a bit of a digestive bitter, especially if you're doing a very long infusion and you're steeping that chamomile for a long time. The longer that it's in that tea bag in the hot water, the more bitter it becomes. So it's kind of like a two for one anti-anxiety digestive bitter, super cheap, super easy remedy. And like I said earlier, my teacher Claudia Keel would say chamomile is for people who are crying on the outside. That's why it's 
really great for kids, really great for fussy children who are like, oh, my stomach hurts. Are we there yet? It's someone who has no trouble voicing their concerns and is going to tell you and complain about how they're feeling, child or adult. Whereas something like catnip, which is also a lovely anti-anxiety and even digestive herb, is for someone who's going to be sitting there feeling horrible, having digestive symptoms, but they're not going to tell you how they're feeling and they're going to keep it all inside. Right. So even just knowing that can help you kind of customize a digestive blend for someone or try out a tea for yourself. Um, and then we have many other digestive plants and even classes of it of digestive plants. There's certain things called carminatives, which are herbs that just help to release trapped gas from the digestive system. And so often that's where someone's pain and bloating and discomfort is coming from. So and, instead and of using an it over the of, counter, of that sort of herb. So that would be something like fennel. Fennel is mm, a wonderful, okay. super easy kitchen spice that's a carminative. You can just take a few fennel seeds from a spice cabinet and chew on them before or after your meal to help mm. release some of that gas cool. and resolve digestive discomfort. Um, and then, of course, we have the bitters, like I mentioned earlier. And the key with digestive bitters is you want to take them 10 to 15 minutes before your meal so that you can have enough time for those digestive juices to be beautifully stimulated before you start eating your actual meal. And back in the day, we used to do this naturally. People used to eat bitter starters, used to eat bitter greens, right. dandelion greens, endives right. far more consistently than we do now. Now we just kind of go right into the meal. So I had created for my line, I have one um, blend called digestive juice, which is a digestive bitter spray so that you can just keep it in your purse, pull it out and spray mm. it right on your tongue to get that dose of bitter flavor 10 minutes before your meals. And if you're with a group of friends, you pass it around and everyone will be really surprised at how good they feel. But I also have another bitters blend called Gluco Bitters, which has more of these herbs that help to regulate your postprandial glucose response mm. to that meal. So if you're someone who tends to have um, a lot of fatigue after your meals or you tend to have blood sugar spikes, highs and lows throughout the day, that's a bitters blend that has not only digestive bitters, but blood sugar balancing botanicals as well. With the first formula that's more stimulatory, if you will, do you notice mm -hmm. if people have indigestion, reflux, heartburn, is that like HCL, which in that symptom presentation can either make people worse or better, kind of depending on what's going on? Is it sort of a, a hit or miss with that group or, or what do you notice? So it it's interesting. I tried to formulate it so that it would be as applicable to both of those groups as possible. Oh. On the one hand, even people who have some heartburn, some acid reflux often still need some digestive support. The acid is either in the wrong place or um, secreting at the wrong time. They still need some support with digesting their meals. So it'll still be helpful. Um, but for folks who have just like true acid reflux, there's some licorice root in that blend alongside the herbals to help soothe and reduce inflammation within the GI tract if you're having a constant presentation of heartburn acid reflux. So we find that a lot of folks feel a lot better just from the licorice root in that blend and then also get some digestive support. But as you know, there's a population of people who are having acid reflux and heartburn because they don't have enough stomach acid to actually signal the closing of their lower esophageal sphincter after their meal. So food is actually coming back up into the esophagus after they eat. So for that group of people, you're actually helping them to produce enough stomach acid to close the LES so that they're not having an experience of acid reflux at all what we'd call gut-brain neuromodulators, which are drugs that are conventionally considered as antidepressants, but used at a much lower dose than mm. for the treatment of depression, uh, acting on pain signaling. And I think that's one of the things that came out of, of our trial that was published in The Lancet uh, recently, which was, a, which was a definitive trial of amitriptyline for irritable bowel syndrome in primary care, was that we measured both peripheral symptoms, so global IBS symptoms and abdominal pain, but we also measured mood during the trial and during the six months of treatment with the amitriptyline versus the placebo, there was an improvement in the peripheral symptoms, so the global IBS symptoms and the abdominal pain with the amitriptyline over the placebo, but there was no difference in mood scores during that trial at all. So that suggests that although amitriptyline has central effects, um, or certainly has antidepressant effects. It wasn't acting as an antidepressant. It may be having central effects in the trial, but they weren't. The central effects weren't an improvement in mood. Um, so I think that's really interesting. 
Yeah, I think it's really interesting also, and, and I really appreciate how you have changed the labels that we may use from, you know, these are antidepressants that are being used for people who are depressed or it's all in your head toward these are gut brain neuromodulators, if you will. And I think that that reframing is really hopefully for people empowering. And the amitriptyline data that you published, I think is also super interesting in, in the sense that as we modulate serotonin and norepinephrine, we're seeing this favorable change on these symptoms. And it also has me wondering, since serotonin modulates the immune system, we know it partially functions as a chemoattractant. It'll, it'll pull immune cells to sites of inflammation. It can modulate macrophages and monocytes. How do you, or how much do you think that the amitriptyline is, in part of its mechanism of actions, influencing the immune system? And this kind of ties back to your, your comment on oral tolerance. So if there's this whole you know, interconnected web of causality and loss of oral tolerance to food, which is mediated by the immune system, is part of this, do you think part of what these previously called antidepressants, now called sort of gut-brain modulators, are doing is affecting the immune system in a favorable way? Really, really insightful comment and question. I think, firstly, I'd just point out that it's Doug Drossman who is uh, the sort of godfather of um, disorders of gut-brain interaction. He first was one of the first people to introduce this concept of, of ant low-dose antidepressants being gut-brain neuromodulators. So that's, that's not something that I, a term that I've come up with, although I've been involved in work with him to summarize um, you know, the evidence for the efficacy of these drugs across all disorders of gut-brain interaction. Um, but yes, because tricyclic antidepressants are, you know, 60 or 70 years old, they're a drug that, you know, I guess in inverted commas is quite dirty because they have multiple effects on different receptors. So they have serotonergic re effects, they have uh, effects on norepinephrine, they have anti, anti, uh, anti muscarinic effects, which often lead to the side effects that patients experience, like the dry mouth and the drowsiness. But they also act on histamine, so they have antihistamine effects. Supplementally, I really like probiotics, I really like bone broth protein, I really like um, or collagen, something like that. Um, I really like astragalus as an herb. Mm. You know, that was used, especially if you have a form of autoimmunity tied to some sort of inflammatory bowel disease. It's very strengthening long-term for, for those sort of conditions. I like licorice root a lot. Um, and I think zinc and vitamin D are two really important nutrients that a lot of people are missing there as well when it comes to uh, gut health. Um, and there are more things, but I think those are some prime things. There is another type of berry, berry, which is vastly under-recognized, but we know that it's probably the most common. It's just not been very well characterized in the literature, and that is gastrointestinal berry, berry. And the gastrointestinal system, I like to think of it not as its individual system, but as a compartment or as a, an, a branch of the autonomic nervous system, because, you know, the brain has to communicate to the gut what to do and at what times. Now, although it can function semi-autonomously, as we know, um, when there is any problem with the communication between the brain and the gut, that you can end up with many manifestations, which I think we I think we misdiagnose sometimes, or at least I know, I know that at least a portion of people are misdiagnosed. Um, and that is through experience with many hundreds, probably thousands now in terms of my overall network of people, thousands of people who've treated their gut problems with taking thiamine. And there's, if you look in the literature, it's, it's very far between people who've been making connections. It's really under-recognized. But the way I like to think of it is that if there's any problem with how your nerves co communicate to whichever part of the body, then, then thiamine could be involved. <laughs>